so hi, thank you all for coming. This is a very nice little group. I think we're going to be best friends by the end of this presentation. Um, so yeah, my name is Marissa Meyer. Uh, Cinder is my debut novel. Um, and it is a science fiction retelling of the classic Cinderella story. Um, it is set in future Asia, and it tells the story of Cinder, who is a 16-year-old girl who is a cyborg, which means that she's part human and part machine. Uh, and in this future uh, reality that she lives in, cyborgs are really oppressed, they're kind of seen as second-class citizens, because people don't really understand them, um, so there's a lot of prejudice against them. And so Cinder's stepmother is really not happy to have this cyborg living in her household. Um, but Cinder, being cyborg, has given her this really unique skill. She's an excellent mechanic. Um, she can fix pretty much anything. So she's opened up a booth in the weekly marketplace. Um, and people bring her hover cars and androids and whatever, and she fixes them, and that's how she earns her keep with her stepmother. Um, this reputation of being such a great mechanic one day brings the prince of her country to her booth, needing her to fix a broken android. And this android has a really big secret. So when Cinder accepts this job of fixing this android, it kind of thrusts her into this uh, world of politics and this cold war that's been going on between Earth and the Lunars. And the Lunars are a species of people who have evolved from a moon colony um, and have developed powers of mind control and manipulation. Um, so that's the basic premise of Cinder. It is the first in a four book series. Each book in the series uh, will be based on a different fairy tale. Uh, so even though Cinder continues to be the main hero um, of all four books, in each book she's going to meet a different fairy tale inspired heroine. Um, so book two, Scarlet, will be based on Little Red Riding Hood. Book three is based on Rapunzel. And book four is based on Snow White. Um, as these kind of fairy tale heroines join together um, against their mutual enemy, which is the queen, the evil queen, and the evil lunars. So that's pretty much the premise of Cinder and the Lunar Chronicles. And today I'm going to talk a little bit about how I came to write these books, how I got the idea for them. Um, and it starts way back about. 13 or 14 years ago, uh, when my best friend introduced me to a little show called Sailor Moon. Okay, there's some chuckles, so some of you are familiar. Um, if you're not, Sailor Moon was a, an anime, a Japanese cartoon that was really popular in the early 90s. Um, and it's about these girls who are like superheroes and run around fighting monsters. Um, and it was a really cheesy show, but like awesome in its cheesiness. Um, and I fell in love with this show, uh, and so I, I started writing fan fiction for it. Uh, which is when, you know, a writer takes an existing story, it could be a book, it could be a movie or a TV series, or really whatever, um, and they're inspired by these characters in this story world, and they start creating their own stories uh, using these other characters um, and story worlds. So that's what I did. For me, it was Sailor Moon. It really inspired me, and I got really excited and really into it, and I started writing fan fiction, and I was posting it online and, and getting lots of, you know, good feedback and critique and meeting lots of great people who are also Sailor Moon fans. <coughs> uh, and this would go on for many, many years. Um, I tried kind of planning with writing a couple novels during that time, but nothing was really taking off. I wasn't really, you know, super excited about any of these other novels that I started. And I always went back to fan fiction um, and ended up writing probably about 45 works of fanfic over this 10-year period. Well, one day... I heard about a contest that was being held by one of the big Sailor Moon websites. And the coordinator of the contest had put together a list of like 10 things. And to enter the contest, you had to choose two of them and include them in a short story. So I chose to set the story in the future and to include a fairy tale character. And the story that I wrote for that was kind of a futuristic retelling of Puss in Boots, which is one of my favorite fairy tales. Um, and it was about this, like, robotic talking cat who was adopted by a schoolgirl, but, like, tries to convince her that she's really a princess and blah, blah, blah. Anyway, it was a lot of fun to write. Um, I found out later that only two stories had been submitted for that writing contest, and mine did not win. Oh. But that's okay, because it gave me this really great idea. Um, and that was, of course, to, I could write an entire series of futuristic fairy tales. Um, I did some research, I couldn't find that anybody had done it before, 
Um, and it's kind of hard this day and age to come up with an idea that nobody's done before, so I was really excited by that. Um, and I thought that it had a lot of potential, these futurizing of different fairy tales. So I took a few months and I, you know, plotted out, okay, what can I do? You know, maybe Rumpelstiltskin is an android and, and maybe Rapunzel lives in a satellite instead of a tower and, you know, all these different ideas. I was just brainstorming and coming up with different things that you could do. And one night, as I'm drifting off to sleep, I had kind of my lightning flash moment, um, which was Cinderella as a cyborg. Um, and I thought, well, gosh, who doesn't love cyborgs? Right? And I, I could envision her very clearly very early on as having this robotic hand and foot, um, of being kind of a tomboy, of being a mechanic, um, of having like android friends instead of mice friends, and, and all these things. You know, she was a very clear character in my head um, from pretty early on. And I got really, really excited about it. Um, and even though my original idea had been for each book in the series to be kind of a standalone story, the more I thought about it and the more I, um, you know, plotted out Cinder's story, the more these other fairy tale characters just kind of started popping up. Like the evil queen from Snow White was all of a sudden terrorizing Cinderella, too. Um, and I hadn't really intended that to happen. But as I brainstormed and thought about it, um, all four books just kind of started to grow together into one continuous storyline. Well, meanwhile, I heard about another contest. Um, this was like September of 2008 or so, and um, I was getting ready to do National Novel Writing Month, which is um, kind of this worldwide phenomenon. Um, I'm seeing some nods, so some of you have heard of it. Um, National Novel Writing Month is when people sign up and you attempt to write a 50,000 word novel during the month of November. Um, so 30 days to write a 50,000 word novel. And it started like a dozen years ago with like eight friends in San Francisco who were just challenging each other to write um, these novels in a month. And from there it just grew. And today, I mean, I think last November there was over a million people worldwide who participated. And so it's kind of become this really big thing. So back in 2008, I'd done it before. Um, the two years previous, I had written fan fictions uh, during NaNoWriMo succeeded with my 50,000 words, so I was feeling good, like, I can do this, I have proven that I can, am capable um, of writing 50,000 words in a month, and I had this novel idea that I'm really excited for. Uh, so I was ready, I was prepared. But then I heard about this other contest, um, and this other contest was being held by the Seattle area NaNoWriMo coordinator person. Um, and somehow they got hooked up with the director of the upcoming Star Trek series. And the contest was whatever Seattle area writer wrote the most words in November would win a walk-on role in an upcoming episode of Star Trek. <laughs> and I was like, that would be freaking awesome! Um, so, you know, I come from a family of geeks, you know, my, my uncle is a huge Trekkie. Um, and I remember when we were kids, one of the Star Trek movies went, came on to theaters and my entire family went in costume opening <laughs> night. So we have pictures of like me and my brother as Klingons who were like five years old. And anyway, so I have this history um, of this science fiction background and I'm thinking, okay, if I get to actually be on Star Trek, I'm going to be like the coolest person in my family. So I had to try. Um, and I completely ignored the fact that I was working full time and taking classes toward a master's degree. Um, and, and you know, who cares about all that? I'm going to write the most words and get on Star Trek. So I did some math and I did some research and I figured that to have a chance, I would have to write 150,000 words during November. And that was really daunting, but I, you know, I know how many words I can write per hour. I knew, okay, I, you know, this much time during my commute, this much time during my lunch break, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, I scheduled it down, down pretty much to the hour, and I was going to do it. I was really determined. Um, and I also had outlines. I made outlines not only for Cinder, but for the entire series. Um, so, November 1st arrived. I started writing like a mad crazy woman. I don't remember anything about this month, um, but at about 9 o'clock p.m. on November 30th, I submitted my words, and the word count came back at 150,011 words. 
So I'd done it. I was so happy and pleased with myself, and then I, you know, fell asleep and was a zombie for like two weeks. Um, and I don't really remember too much about that time either. But when I came back to it, you know, after I had some time to recover it and, you know, wasn't feeling quite so frazzled anymore, um, I read through the first draft of Cinder, and it was terrible, as first drafts tend to be. Um, but I was still really excited about it, and I could see that the book had bones of potential. And I really loved the characters, really loved the idea. Um, and so I would then spend about two years rewriting and rewriting again, and revising and revising, and editing and polishing. And, you know, it was a lot of work, obviously. But at the end of the two years, I had a book that I felt was as good as I could possibly make it. And I was really proud of it. And I thought, okay, I'm going to send it out to the world and see what happens. And I was prepared for rejection. You know, I'm familiar with the publishing industry. I know that very few people get their first novels published. I know that you can, you know, have hundreds of rejections before you, you know, get that one agent that's willing to take a chance on you. And I was ready for that. But it didn't happen for me that way. I was actually really lucky in that it only took about two months to get an agent. Um, and I ended up signing with the first agent I queried. Um, after that, I worked with her for about two weeks to get the novel um, to where she thought it was ready to send out. She sent it out on a Friday, and we had our first offer on Monday. Wow. So it went really, really quickly. Um, and that is, of course, how Cinder came into the world. And now you're all like, but did you get to be on Star Trek? <laughs> um, and the answer is no. <laughs> Stupid contest. I'm not very good at contests, clearly. Um, the first, I came in third place. The person who came in first place only wrote about a thousand words more than me, which made me really mad because I turned it in at 9 o'clock p.m. and I had three hours left. Um, but anyway, it doesn't matter because I obviously ended up with a book, which is the biggest prize I could have asked for. So that is the story of how I came to write Cinder. Um, and now I'm happy to answer any questions that you guys might have. Um, I do have a red shoe tape dispenser um, oh. <laughs> that we've been doing as a giveaway, so the first person to ask a question gets a red shoe tape dispenser. <laughs> What advice would you give to somebody who wants to start writing books? What advice would I give to somebody who wants to start writing books? Um, it's really cliche, but the two pieces of advice you hear all the time are also the best ones, and that's to read as much as you can and to write as much as you can. Um, I really do feel that um, reading is the only way you're going to learn about the market and what appeals to you and what kind of books you want to write. And writing is the only way that you're going to learn how to do that. Um, you know, I, I like craft books. I like critique groups and beta readers and all those things that are also important. But the number one thing is always just to write as much as you can. Yes. Um, do you think that maybe you would write, a, after Cinder, would you write if Cinder has kids or anything, but would you write about their kids? Would I write about Cinder's kids? Um, that's an excellent question, and I can honestly say that it's never crossed my mind. Um, I, I would never say never. Um, I think that if down the line I got inspired to continue this story, maybe it's a generational thing, then I would certainly consider it. But at this time, I don't have any ideas for, for the future of Cinder um, and the other characters' children. Yes? What all did you read? Um, these days, I read almost exclusively within YA, um, but YA itself is a really diverse genre, and so I read dystopians, and I read contemporaries, and paranormals, and sci-fis, and fantasies, and pretty much everything, um, but these days, I, I very specifically read within YA. Uh, part of that is just because I enjoy the genre so much, um, and I think that it has a lot of really great stories and great authors. Um, and part of it also is a business marketing decision to know what's coming out and what's being really popular right now. Yes. You have um, three other books that are in the Lunar Chronicles. Is that all you're planning on right now? Or are you going to do more? <laughs> you have plans beyond the Lunar Chronicles. Um, yeah, I have a file full of ideas um, for what will come after the Lunar Chronicles. 
Obviously, I'm going to be stuck in Lunar Chronicles land for quite a while. The fourth one comes out in 2015. It's like forever away. Um, but I do. I have lots of ideas. Um, we'll probably also be within YA, um, but who knows if I'll ever branch out into other genres and age groups also. Do you have the other books written already? Or um, I have. Scarlet Book 2 is pretty much done. Um, I'm working with my editor right now on kind of our last tweaking revisions. Um, and I have first drafts completed of books 3 and 4. So who are some of your favorite YA authors? Some of my favorite YA authors. Um, John Green, who we were just talking about, is phenomenal. Um, Scott Westerfeld has been really inspirational to me. Uh, Kristen Kishore, I think, is brilliant. Cannot wait for Bitter Blue. Um, and uh, Marcus Zusak also is one of those authors that I kind of hate because he's so <laughs> talented. Um, yeah. He did The Book Thief, right? Yeah. The Book Thief, yeah. yeah. Um, it's funny for me, though, I actually really hate the question, who are your favorite authors? <laughs> <laughs> of course, everybody asks. It gets asked at every event, and at every event, I like pick out new favorites, because um, there's just so many great authors out there. <laughs> so how long does it take you from the outline to writing the book? Well, um, Cinder took a little over two years, um, yeah, a little over two years, but it's hard to say because I never, uh, like, just start, like, I, I outline and then I write this book and write, and, and I'm just working on that book exclusively um, for this period of time. Um, you know, so Cinder, even though it took over two years, um, I also wrote the first drafts of the next two books in the series during that time, and I was also working on another fanfic that I'd already started prior to that. Um, so if you were to take all the time that I was exclusively working on Cinder, it would probably be around a year or so. But hey, you mentioned at the beginning when you were speaking that you were going to school and working. And, mm -hmm. um, do you not, like, do you do this full time? Do you have any other job? Or what do you do now along with writing? At this point, I am a full-time writer. Yeah, I, I was very lucky um, to receive an advance that was enough for me to be able to quit my day job. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Dream come true, for sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, if that hadn't happened, which of course I had not expected that to happen, um, I was a, a freelance typesetter and proofreader before, um, and I would have continued to do that, I'm sure. What is your master's in? My master's is in publishing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so I, I always knew that I wanted to work in books. I mean, I've always wanted to be a writer. That's always been the end goal. Um, but of course, when you're growing up and you tell people, you know, I'm going to be a writer, then they're like, you know, that's nice. Um, but you have to go to school and get a real job still. Um, and so I, you know, even though I always wanted to be a writer and I was really hopeful that I could make that happen, um, I also wanted to be realistic, and so I knew that I wanted to work in books, um, and so I, I went to school, I have a bachelor's degree in creative writing, but I minored in the printing and publishing arts, um, and then I have my master's degree in publishing, and I worked as an editor for five years before becoming a freelance typesetter. Um, so, you know, in my head I thought maybe I'll continue to be an editor, or maybe I'll be a book agent, or maybe I'll be a publicist. Um, I, I, you know, wasn't sure exactly where that path was going to take me, um, but I knew that I had to work in books. Okay. I hope you don't mind me. No. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, I, I have a daughter right now. She's a graphic design artist full time, but she has a book blog. In fact, she's reviewed your book and everything on her blog. She's read the book. I she maybe tweeted me about you being here. <laughs> Somebody <laughs> tweeted, my mom's going to be here. Her name is Jenna. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> um, anyways, um, she, okay, she's a graphic designer. She has a book blog, and she's doing all these, she's trying to get connected with, you know, like different authors, and she has gotten connected with a couple of them, and so she goes around and tries to go to book signings and all mm -hmm. that. 
Uh, she is in the process now of writing her first novel. She says she'll have it done like next year. Um, won't let anybody know what it's about. Yet. <laughs> but of course, I know eventually she's going to want to find a publisher. How do you go about that? Is there any advice I can take back to her? And yeah. Because um, I know that's Difficult. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, for what you're saying, she's coming next February. See, I live in downtown Seattle, mm -hmm. and I guess Seattle's having some kind of big book something or other mm -hmm. next January or February. I don't know all the details. Yeah, she's going to be here, so she said by that time she should be ready to, you know, publish her book if she can get some. Uh huh. Anyways, yeah. Yeah, um, these days you pretty much have to get a literary agent first. Um, there was a time when authors could submit directly to publishers, um, but these days most publishers won't take unsolicited manuscripts. Um, so you have to get an agent, and then an agent will pitch to publishers um, and sell it for you. So how you get an agent um, is by querying. Uh, query letters or really emails these days. Um, it's when you, you send them an email that introduces yourself, um, this is my book, this is what my book's about, um, how long it is, blah, blah, blah. Um, and then a lot of times you'll include like a little bio about yourself if you have a bachelor's in creative writing or whatever it is. Um, and you send that to agents um, who represent your type of book. And if they read your query and they're intrigued by the premise and think you have something, then they'll write back and say, hey, I'd like to see the manuscript. And then you send them the manuscript, and if they like that, hopefully they will um, take you on as a client. Um, and then once you have an agent, you sign with an agent, it is their job then to approach publishers um, and, and get you the book deal. So once it comes time for her, um, to start querying agents, there are a lot of resources online about how to write a query letter um, and how to find agents. Um, so a quick Google search will bring up a lot of information. Knowing her, she's probably yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, she's mm -hmm. amazing. Great, right. awesome. You said um, that Cinder just kind of came to you. How did you get the other three? Like, how did you choose those specific other three books? Um, that's an excellent question, and it's. I wish I'd taken notes because it's kind of blurry. Um, like I said, I had been brainstorming for a while about different ways to futurize these other fairy tales. Um, and I had started out with like, a list of like 10 of my favorite stories that I was considering. Um, and for the four that ended up making it into the series, they were the ones that just kind of kept coming to the top and that I was most excited for um, and that I had the most ideas for. Um, and that as I thought about them, they just started crossing over and all of a sudden Cinderella and Little Red Riding Hood were friends. And I'm like, how did that happen? Um, and so as I was brainstorming and considering all the different things that I could do with the series, um, these four tales just kind of came to the top and worked together. Hello, welcome. Have you ever watched the uh, show What's Yes, I really am loving Once Upon a Time. Um, and it's exciting for me because obviously I've been a huge fairy tale fan since I was a kid. Um, and so I, you know, when I started writing this book, I had no idea that I was about to be a part of like this big fairy tale trend. Um, so it's really timely and worked out very well um, that fairy tales are kind of hitting this social nerve right now. Um, and it's great for me, being a huge fairy tale fan, because there's a lot, you know, with Once Upon a Time out in Grimm, um, there's two Snow White movies coming out this year, there's a Hansel and Gretel, there's a Jack and the Beanstalk movie, um, there's just a lot of fairy tales uh, coming out right now, and books too, there's quite a few other YA retellings um, in the, the pipe, pipeline. So, yeah, so I'm really enjoying Once Upon a Time and, and really enjoying the whole phenomenon. The changes that they asked for were very minimal. Um, my agent had virtually nothing. I think the only thing she wanted changed was um, 
For people who have read it, in the very first scene, uh, Cinder meets Prince Kai at her booth. Um, and in the version, the printed version, he's wearing a hoodie because he's uh, incognito. Um, but that wasn't how I'd originally written. He just like showed up in princely gear and they were like, shouldn't he like have a horde of girls following him around or something? Um, and so they wanted him to be more incognito and that's like the only change my agent had. Um, as for my editor, she had a few more things. Um, we added almost an entire scene to the ball. Um, got almost an entire new chapter added to it. Um, but other than that, it was still pretty minimal thing and it, things, and it was more um, expanding on what I'd already written than making actual changes. We just had some new folks come in. Could you um, give a brief synopsis of the story again? Yeah. And then tell a little bit about how you came to write the book again? I could give my whole speech again. Yeah. Now. Yeah. Um, yeah, so Cinder is a, um, it's a sci-fi retelling of the classic Cinderella story. Um, and it features Cinder, who's a 16-year-old girl who is part machine and part human, uh, making her a cyborg. And in this futuristic um, world that she's living in, cyborgs are kind of seen as second-class citizens. And so her stepmother is not happy to have this cyborg living in her care. Um, but Cinder, being cyborg, has been given a really unique skill um, of mechanics. She can fix pretty much anything. So she's um, opened up a booth in the weekly market um, for people to bring in their broken hover cars and, and androids and whatever, and she'll fix them. Uh, and that's how she earns her keep with her stepmother. Um, and then one day, this reputation of being such a great mechanic brings the prince of her country uh, to her booth, needing her to fix a broken android. Um, and when she accepts that job, it launches her into this world, um, this cold war that's going on between Earth and uh, the evil queen. So that's, that's the basic premise of Cinder. Um, yeah, I don't know how <laughs> I don't know how to give my spiel without giving my whole spiel. <laughs> um, you yeah. tried to write a whole bunch of different books before you actually made it to this one. Uh, pretty much. I wrote a lot of fan fiction actually. That's kind of my story. Is that I, I wrote Sailor Moon fan fiction for many, 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 many years, um, and then it was a a contest for Sailor Moon fan fiction that gave me the initial idea to write this futuristic fairy tale um, series. Uh, and then uh, once I had the idea and I had my you know, light bulb moment of a cyborg Cinderella, um, I wrote the first draft really fast, took about two weeks, it didn't get to be on Star Trek, um, and then two years later I had a book. Right, synopsis? <laughs> these dual perspectives of people who are reading it as writers um, and then people who are coming to it as readers just wanting to be entertained. Um, so that worked out really well. And so I, I had these four readers, I went through two rounds with them, um, and actually after the second round one of them wrote me back um, and said, this is ready, send it out now. Um, and so that was kind of the, the push, like you, can, you have to stop tweaking it and send it out into the world. So. But I didn't let my family read it. My family was not happy with it. <laughs> mm -hmm. You said that you write fanfic. I saw on your blog that you have your own section on fanfic. I now. know! I know! I went and I looked it up and I was reading some of them before I came. Because I like reading fanfic. Um, and it, there's a lot of them that are really good. Because I've only read the first five chapters. So when he's reading the fanfic, I'm like, oh, I need to get the book now. Yeah, <laughs> but there's spoilers. <laughs> I try to, I try to, I'm like, okay, I can't, I have to stop. Yes. And I, I heard you, I read that you were excited about that. I'm blog. so excited. So what she's talking about, um, there's a website called fanfiction.net, um, which is the biggest, you know, archive online of fanfictions, and they have every kind of fanfiction out there. 
Um, and I, I did find out here just a few days ago, a friend uh, emailed me to tell me that there was a Lunar Chronicles section. And at the time, it had two stories on it. I don't know if it had more when you were looking. Um, but yeah, and so that was kind of like the biggest thing ever for me, because I <laughs> felt like, you know, I'd gone full circle. Yeah, exactly. So, um, actually, the, the book hit the New York Times bestsellers list the first week that it was out, and, like, that was really huge, but having a fanfiction.net page, like, completely dwarfs everything else. <laughs> That's so cool. <laughs> Are there any other questions? Any questions from the, the, the new arrivals? Anything you'd like to know that... to get to meet them and hear what they have to say and 
Yeah, it's great. Great that libraries and bookstores do it. I'm a library board trustee for Kitsap Regional Library. And mm -hmm. So we try to cooperatively mm -hmm. go to as many of the West Sand Read events or the foundation events that we can. And so I've been richly blessed to be able to go to um, quite a few author um, yeah, that's fantastic. events. And um, had never been in my earlier years. And I find it so interesting to see them, you know, see authors, <laughs> and hear them, and, yeah, and their process, and yeah. how they came up with the idea. I, I am not a writer, um, so it's just so fascinating to me that, that these books are in these people's brains, you know, and furthermore, that they can get them out there, and, yeah. and it's just, I just have a lot of um, admiration for the talent. I'd love to read granddaughter loves to read. Awesome. And so it's great to uh, to meet authors. It's also interesting to me that some of them are very shy <laughs> and are not good speakers, but yet here they are. Yeah. You know? and so, yeah. So thank Definitely. you, thank you for sharing your well, talent you. with all yeah. of us. Yeah, it's been really fascinating being on tour and um, you know, talking to these other booksellers who have many authors come through, and they all have a story of, you know, Stephanie Meyer was here, and she only had five people come to her oh book signing. And, you know, these, these crazy stories, and, and it's almost impossible to imagine these authors before they were who they are. Yes. Um, and so, you know, for me as a writer, it's really fascinating hearing those stories um, and, and you know, having this moment of, you know, oh, we're all, they're all kind of like me. So, it's really great. Yeah. Um, the cover art for your book, how did that come about? Did you get any say in that? Um, they sent an early uh, version to me, and I loved it. Um, my... My one question when they when they first sent it to me and I saw it and um, spoiler alert there are no red shoes in the book and so I was kind of like uh, is that weird <laughs> there are no red shoes um, and and so I asked them you know maybe we should have it be a clear shoe or something um, but then they convinced me that it was for marketing and that it was going to jump off the shelves. Um, and then also I've gathered that there's going to be like a red theme throughout all the covers um, of the series. So, so they were thinking ahead. Um, and yeah, so at that point once they convinced me that the red was okay, then I was like, okay, well that's fabulous. Don't change a thing. So I'm really, really pleased with the cover. Have you ever thought about doing any illustrations or anything throughout the books? Or what, what makes people, what makes authors decide to do any illustrations? You know, um, I'm going to guess that that's usually the publisher's decision um, and why they would choose to do that. Um, I'm not really sure if maybe they're hoping it'll, you know, aim at a younger age group, like with Harry Potter, um, had little illustrations at the opening of each chapter. Um, the only examples I can think of that were the author's decision would be like um, Scott Westerfeld's Leviathan series. Um, and I think that that series was pitched as, you know, Scott Westerfeld is writing and the other guy, whoever he was, um, is illustrating. And they sold the books as, you know, we were a team doing this. Um, and, and so that's one example of, of a book that was illustrated, but for the most part, it's incredibly rare in young adult books to have illustrations. Some authors also think that they want to start out as illustrators, and then they switch to being authors. For instance, Meg Cabot, who's written the Princess Diaries series, um, she studied illustration. I did not know that. Do we have any writers or illustrators in the audience? <laughs> Just readers, book lovers? Yeah. <laughs> collectors. Awesome, awesome. Oh, yeah. <laughs> have you um, gotten any movie deals? Because there's a lot of books. <laughs> have you gotten any? Um, we have had an offer, um, but it's it would be for an animated film. Which is not really what I have in mind. I'd love to see it live action. Yeah. Um, so we have a 
What do we have? A, a phone meeting scheduled with the, the studio next week um, to discuss it, uh, but at this point I don't know that we'll be accepting the offer. Because well, I really want to live actually. <laughs> That'd be so cool. Yeah. So cool. <laughs> would be your ideal uh, <laughs> Who would be my ideal sender? Um, hmm. I should say that I am not really up on pop culture in Hollywood. <laughs> uh, not Kristen Stewart. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody but Kristen Stewart. Oh, wow. um, <laughs> that kind of reminds me of Cinder in some ways is Ellen Page, um, who is Juno. Yeah. Um, but even then, like if they did make it into a movie, I wouldn't actually want Ellen Page because then you see her and you know it's Ellen Page. Um, so I'm a big fan of unknown actors in movies. Yeah. Yeah. I have um, a friend who's an aspiring actress, um, and she's tall and red-headed and beautiful, and I'm like, you need to be Scarlet! And they make the Scarlet movie. I don't think they really care what the authors think, though, when they're casting. Yeah. <laughs> what are some of your favorite books? The Hunger Games. The Hunger Games! How excited are you for the movie? <laughs> so excited. Graceland. Yes. Then I just got an arc for Bitter Blue. <laughs> you were <laughs> on one of our tour stops. Um, one of the booksellers had the arc and she offered it to me. And I was like, oh no, I'll just wait and buy it when it comes out. And now I'm like, what was I thinking? So mad at myself. <laughs> Have you read it yet? No. <laughs> I'm trying to read the books that I check out from the library yeah. first. Yeah, you get that. <laughs> matched, yes. Yeah. I love the matched cover. It's one of my favorite covers of all time. I really like Divergent. Oh, yeah. I love Divergent. Divergent was like my number one read. That was Scorpio Races last year. Oh, Scorpio Races. Fabulous. Really good, yeah. Daughters of Mouth and Bone. Yes, oh, yes, another good one. Yeah. Mm hmm. Um, Tiger's Curse. So, yeah. Oh, I haven't read that. I've been hearing a lot. It's really a lot cool. I just that. read it. I read like all three books in two weeks, I think. <laughs> I just awesome. got so into it. Now, it's like fantasy, or like high fantasy. Is that correct? Uh, I no? wouldn't describe it that way. No, how would you uh, describe it? I don't know. It's, it's set in modern time, but there's a definite connection to like ancient India. Mm. Uh, so, it's I mean, there are some aspects of it that are definitely fantasy, but it, I wouldn't necessarily call it that. Okay. Sounds good. It's the Iron Fae series? Yeah, it is. The Iron Fae? Is that, um... Is that, is, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I haven't read that one either. Yeah. Is that paranormal? Kind of. It's more mixed with paranormal, kind of what your book is in a way, and William Shakespeare. Really? <laughs> That's unexpected. Um, what what did I say that you were writing? Um, you really like writing in the, the, the young adult genre. Uh, sometimes I have a really hard time even putting my finger on what exactly that means because when you read the book thief, but nothing about that seems juvenile. And I really appreciated that, um, that it wasn't taking stance that kids can't handle the truth, mm -hmm. or, you know what I mean? But what do you feel are the restrictions in writing in that genre? You know, that's an excellent question. Um, when we were at this school presentation today, one of um, the teachers asked, you know, what exactly makes it YA? Um, and that's a question that I think the industry is still trying to figure out. Um, obviously, most YAs have protagonists in their teenage years. Um, but even then, not you know, there are adult books with teenage protagonists, um, and there are YA books with college age protagonists, um, and so that's not always a clear indicator. And I don't know really what makes something YA, um, and I also don't necessarily feel that there are these restrictions. I mean, there are YA books um, that have drugs in them, and sex, and, and rape, and violence, and murder, and you know, they can be as dark as adult books. 
um, and deal with these really, really intense issues. Um, and so I, I don't really know. I don't. I, I personally don't feel as though I have any restrictions on me writing in the genre. Um, obviously, there are writers who will choose, you know, not to have any cursing or not to have any sex or whatever. And I, I think that's up to every author to make their own decision. But I don't think that the genre as a whole says you can't do that. So. Well, we have so many readers here who are adult readers who are reading the YA books. It's mm-hmm. just, it's really interesting to see how our circulation has gone up. Yeah. Um, and one of the things that we notice is that in Europe, quite often books that are YA here will be adult there or vice versa. Hmm. Oh, interesting. So it that depends, is interesting. It depends on what the publisher wants to do. Mm-hmm. So I wonder if like the book thief would have been considered a lot, or an adult book in Europe. I think it was an adult book in Europe. Yeah, that makes sense. It's interesting. Do you think it's a marketing thing? Um, I think it very well could be, especially these days, um, where YA is kind of seen as one of the few bright spots in the industry mm-hmm. um, that continues to sell despite the economy, despite everything. Um, and so it wouldn't surprise me at all if there are publishers that are like, you know, this one's kind of on the edge, so we're going to call it YA just to pick up that market. Very well could be. And I think also a lot of authors these days are seeing how excited people are about the genre um, and how many good stories are coming out of the genre um, that even though they may have seen themselves as adult writers, I think you're seeing more and more adult writers migrate to the YA genre, um, just because it is kind of the, the hip, exciting place to be right now. Mm-hmm. Have you read Beauty Queens by Bright? I have. Not oh, so Bright, right, actually. You didn't like it? I didn't like it. <laughs> I didn't like it. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> I, I'm not typically a satire fan in general. I get bored with it. I'm like, just tell me the story. <laughs> so you have a thousand teenagers following you. <laughs> I just imagine, I mean, I, don't, I was a middle school teacher, and so my introduction to YA was always from the students, and there's no better source of, like, what's good than just listening to the kids. Right. Like but they also become obsessed really quickly. <laughs> uh-huh. I imagine you seeing screaming girls. <laughs> I haven't had any screaming girls yet. Um, I have signed a couple arms, <laughs> um, but I don't like I, I, my Twitter. I have like twenty three hundred Twitter followers now. Wow! Um, and I think the Lunar Chronicles Facebook page has close to eight thousand likes. Whatever that means. It's <laughs> a good sign. It's a good sign. <laughs> Um, the Facebook, Lunar Chronicles Facebook page is managed by my publisher. Um, and then I also have, you know, my Marissa Meyer Facebook page that I do, but I only have like 600 likes. Not as likable as my books are. <laughs> what are you reading? Um, what am I reading? Right now I'm reading, um... Jessica's Guide to Dating on the Dark Side. Oh, yeah. Yeah, about halfway through that. Um, that? They all just kind of jumble together. I read, you know, I read probably about two books a week, so I'm always like, what did I want to before that? Yeah. I'm not sure if the paranormal romance trend is ever going to end. Yeah, (laughs) yeah. It just goes on and on and on. Right. (laughs) Indeed, it does. Um, And I... Like, kind of honestly, I'm pretty much over the vampire werewolf thing <laughs> myself. Um, but I'm going to a conference at the end of February um, down in LA, and there's going to be about 20 YA authors. So I'm trying to read as many of those um, books that I can, which is, um, I can't even think of the author's name, but the author of Jessica's Guide to Dating on the Dark Side is going to be there. So that's how I picked it up. Which is kind of nice, having all these events coming up where I'm going to be meeting other authors, because it really helps me streamline my reading list. It kind of makes the decisions for me. When you go to a bookstore, what section besides YA do you kind of gravitate towards? Um... I have, you know, my kind of favorite nonfiction sections. I love cooking books. Um, 
I, for a long time, I would, you know, look at health books um, and self-help. I kind of have, like, a, an obsession with self-help, like, organize my life, <laughs> um, And writing guides, uh, the reference section, I, I always kind of end up migrating over there. Um, but other than that, it just depends on, you know, whatever my interest of the day is. Um, we got married last October, so I spent a lot of time looking at wedding books, you know, that sort of thing. <laughs> Yeah. What do you think of how books have wanted to be books? Um, I think it's great, honestly. I think that anything that makes people read is two thumbs up for me. Um, how does that affect authors, though, when you don't have some physical books? Well, um, it affects us in a few different ways. Uh, there's the mental association of, you know, if I don't have a physical book to hold, it's not really real. Um, and I do know that, you know, a lot of authors, we have this dream of going into a bookstore and holding our book. Um, and that's very, you know, real and, and valid. But to me, um, the goal is to share the stories. And as much as I love holding my actual book, if there comes a day when they're not there and it's all virtual, as long as people are still buying the books and reading them, then that's okay. Um, I just want to share the stories um, and get paid for it, you know, hopefully. Um, which, obviously, there is a problem with piracy, virtual books. Um, they haven't quite figured out how to keep them from being pirated. That's an issue that publishers are working through right now. Um, but as far as, like, royalties and all that go, um, royalties are actually higher on ebooks than they are on printed books. So that's, that's not really an issue. Um, yeah, but I, like, I don't, I'm sure there will probably come a day when it's all virtual. I don't see it happening in our lifetime. Um, I think that right now there's a place for both. Um, I still buy a lot of physical books. I like holding a physical, physical book. I like having a bookshelf where I can see them all. But I do have an e-reader, and I bring it whenever I travel. Um, and it's perfect for traveling. So I think that there are pros and cons to both, um, and that they both have a place in the world right now. So where do you write? Um, well, I have an office at the house um, that I'm supposed to write in, and I do sometimes. Um, <laughs> but uh, a lot of times I'll go to a cafe or a restaurant. Um, I find it a lot easier to focus when I'm not at home. Do you have a set time during the day when you write? No, I feel like I should. Um, I, I haven't quite figured out my daily schedule yet. Um, on days when I am working, you know, um, like this last week I've been working on book two revisions. Um, and so I usually will you start writing like around 10 o'clock and go to like 3 or 4 o'clock. Um, and that works pretty well for me. Uh, but this last year has been so, like, there's been so much going on with um, all the promotion and publicity stuff um, that I was called on to do that I haven't really gotten a, a set schedule, a daily work schedule yet. So. Do you want one? Do you want I think it would be lovely to have a set schedule. I'm really a very precise, scheduled, organized person. Um, but, you know, with every day it seemed like I, I wasn't really sure what I was going to be doing and I might be answering interviews and I might be talking to school and I might be, you know, there's all these other weird things that kind of keep cropping up. Um, and it's hard to balance, to find a balance between the promotion and the writing. Um, and then sometimes you might have copy edits come in or, you know, some other editorial work. Um, and so it's, it's a challenge, and I think all writers have to find that balance, and I'm still working on it, and I hope that I, I find that balance eventually. <laughs> I have your Facebook. Um, I'm a fan on your Facebook, both of them, actually. Um, and I love your picture. Who came up with the idea of the shoe? The, the Cinderella picture? Yes. So on my fa Facebook page, there's, I'm in costume as Cinderella, the Disney Cinderella, and I'm holding the shoe. Um, and it came from a guest blog post that I wrote um, for Halloween, and it was, the, the post was on like, you know, fast and easy costume ideas, um, and so Cinderella was one that I did, and um, he 
he was my photographer, and, and we had, hi, me. Um, <laughs> and so, you know, we took a bunch of these pictures, and I thought, well, this one's kind of cute and actually relevant. So Yeah, it just seems to fit really well yeah. with the book. Mm -hmm. I take any excuse to put on a costume. <laughs> Any other questions? Do you listen to music while you write? Not oh. while I write. Um, I prefer quiet when possible. Um, but I do have a Cinder playlist, a Lunar Chronicles playlist. Um, and usually, if I'm, you know, stuck on something, then I'll go and, and lay in the middle of the living room and turn on the playlist and just listen to it. So I do a lot of my kind of daydreaming and plotting and um, brainstorming to music. Uh, but when it comes to the actual writing, I prefer quiet. Should we maybe sign some books? Yeah, <laughs> that's great. All right, so yeah, if you want to come sit over here, you guys can just, um, I'm still selling books over here, and Marissa, you can sit here and just bring your books up and just sign up for them. Great, let's awesome. see where